Good morning, good day, good evening, good overnight, whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. The harlot and harlotry. That's what we're going to be discussing in tonight's Bible study. In this Bible study, we're going to be learning the key to understanding the harlot, that is to say, Mystery Babylon, and not only that, but what it is that God has against harlotry in its biblical sense. In other words, naturally we know that being a harlot is not a good thing uh, here in the human experience. But it's not hard to understand from the Bible, in the Old and the New Testament, what harlotry is. That is to say, what these words, the Word of God, mean that God has spoken to us of harlotry and why God is so angry over the kind of harlotry that he is specifically talking about. It is only a manner of using the key, that is to say the key of David, that God gave us to understand what is being said of the act of harlotry and what is meant by the word beyond its literal use which means to be unfaithful or to be lascivious. In other words, it's to be um, perverse sexually, not in the way of homosexuality or lesbianism, but still to give into the flesh instead of obtaining and living the plan that our Father did between man and woman. Now, our Father gave us certain rules that we are obey, to obey in the commandments of what it means to be married, to become one flesh. But God is not just angry at the harlotry of the flesh. He is more angry on a level where harlotry is a metaphor for taking another God in place of your God taking a false husband in place of your husband. We know that Christ is our husbandman. Doing things which please the flesh but do not please God. So, without a big lead into this, we're going to jump right into this. Be turning, if you will, to the book of Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17, before we begin this, as you should always do, before you do any study in our Father's Word, let us go to our Father in heaven through the name of his Son, and ask for understanding of these things written. So let us pray, brothers and sisters, and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy most glorious and holy name, O Heavenly Father. We come before you once again, Father, gathered together, here and there, whatever time of the day or night, to ask for wisdom, for guidance, for understanding of these, your most holy scriptures, your oracles, Father. We ask you to shine the light of truth upon us, Father. We ask you to open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive these truths. And we ask that you give us greater understanding so that we may know you better, Father, and know what it means to you when you use such words. And we ask these things, Father, nothing wavering in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Joshua Hamashiach Christos. Amen. Amen. So, again, we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 17. This is the telltale chapter that tells you many things about this harlot and about the beast system that will be set up around this harlot. So, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. This again is the writings of John as he was taken in the Spirit and given messages not only from Christ but from the angels of the Lord. 
Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1, and it reads, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, that is to say the vials that are going to be poured out upon Babylon, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great harlot, or excuse me, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, what, what's the subject going to be here? He's going to show them him the judgment. In other words, these vials are fixing to be poured out. There are seven of them. Again, waters here, the harlot that sit upon many waters, are the people, the sea of people, as we will soon understand. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth, that is to say those in fleshly power, have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth, that is to say everyone else who's not necessarily in power, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In other words, her wine is not the pure wine of Christ, of the true vine. Her wine is the wine of fornication, and mankind has been made drunk with it. The flesh, as we see nowadays, is being made drunk with it. It's ever so many more perversions crawl out of the woodwork. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit here. Into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Full of the names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns. Scarlet is usually a color denoting royalty. It can also be associated uh, with blood quite frankly, even with uh, what we refer to as communism or socialism. Flags that bear that color, but moreover here it's royalty because she thinks she sits a queen. Verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hand. I mean, it looks royal full of abominations, that is to say filth, and filthiness of her fornication. Again, we're talking on a metaphoric level here. This is not good by any means. Even though it's in a golden cup and presents itself as royalty or as pretty. Verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of of harlots and abominations of the earth. So let's break this down. Her name is mystery, okay? Mystery, when used in the Bible, means something not understood or something that is vague. It's not really vague if you're attuned to our Father's Word, but it's something that most people do not grasp. Babylon. Babylon, naturally, is a place upon the earth and was a kingdom, historically, but the word Babel, to Babel, and Babylon mean confusion. And then it says the great. In other words, the biggest of all time deceptions. The mother. In other words, the, the very foremost matriarch. The mother of harlots. And abomination. Which is to say, the greatest false religion and filth that has ever occurred or ever will occur, that is to say, prophetically speaking, it will occur. Verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints. In other words, she murdered the, the, the prophets and the apostles and many Christians down through the ages. And with the blood of the martyrs for Jesus... And that, that again would be the Christians down through the ages and uh, anyone who's ever called them faithful. And we know who is responsible for all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. That would be the line of Cain, the Kenites. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, this is not to admire as with uh, envy, to be envious to her, or delightful to see her. It is G2296. And it means 
to look upon as in marveling is in disbelief. You're going to see the same word utilized in the opposite here shortly, where the world wonders after this harlot, after the beast. But this is G2296. And we'll go into that a little bit more when we come to it. Verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? In other words, why did you marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate to you what this means. So that it will not be a mystery any longer. And of the beast which carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Uh, you might be helped by reading Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13 with understanding what this beast is. Verse 2. Excuse me, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was... In other words, when was it? When was the last time this beast had any power? In the first earth age. It is not. That means it is not now. It is not yet. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Well, gee, where do we read of that? Revelation chapter 9. Satan is cast to the earth. He has the keys of hell. And he opens the pit. He has the keys to the pit. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, again, Revelation chapter 9, and go into perdition. Perdition is the lake of fire. Okay, it means destruction. And you can uh, side reference this to Ezekiel 28. What's going to happen to Satan? He's going to be brought to ashes upon the earth. Isaiah 14 is the reason why. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Okay, this is the same word wonder as before, G2296, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That's the very beginning. That's the catabol. When they behold the beast, that was, in other words, the beast that was in the first earth age, when Satan rebelled against God, and is not, that is to say, it's not yet, because this is prophetical, and yet is. In other words, Satan is alive, the fallen angels are alive, and they shall come. Because when Satan is cast to the earth, he's going to open the key, take the keys and open that bottomless pit, and his locust army is going to come of it, which is going to say, his, uh, his fallen angel army. This word wonder, again, is G2296, it is tamadzo. From G2295, it means to wonder by implication, to admire, admire to have admiration, or to marvel, or to wonder. It means to marvel at. And this word is uh, a word of polarity. It can mean a good thing or a bad thing. In the first case, where uh, John is marveling at it, it is certainly not a good thing. But when the peace wander after it, or wander when they see it, they do find it admirable. They look upon it in admiration. Why? They think it's Christ returned. Verse 9. And here is the mind that has wisdom. In other words, if your mind is attuned, this is going to give you wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Okay, this would be continents here. Mountains usually refer to nations. It can refer to literal mountains, but in, in this, since the entire earth is going to fall to this uh, kingdom of Babylon, it's talking about continents. How many continents are there on the earth? Seven. On which the woman sitteth. Now, many conclude that this is referring to Rome and Catholicity, and I get where they go with that, but that is only a type. This deception is going to be far greater than that, and it can be said that the papacy, that is to say the, the Pope and the Catholic Church, at least a, a portion of it, has its part in pulling together this deception as we see all the uh, religions of the world trying to unite because of uh, the Pope reaching out to other religions. Verse 10. 
And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So what are we talking about here? There are seven kings. This is not talking about the ten kings, which come to power for one hour. There are seven kings that have been, and that would be number one, Nimrod, who uh, rebelled against God. Number two, Pharaoh, which God used and hardened his heart, for an example. Number three, the Assyrian, who took the tribes of Israel into captivity, that is to say the ten tribes. Number four, the Babylonians, which uh, took Judah, Benjamin, and the handful of Levites that were them, and uh, also the rest of the people, into captivity. And then you have the Medes and the Persians, which did liberate Israel, but the Persians have become now Iraq, Iran, and, and many of the Islamic states. And then finally, number six, you've got the Greco-Roman Empire, which is where we are now. Why are we still Greco-Roman now? Because since the Greco-Roman Empire fell, we still follow the Greco-Roman way. Which is to say what? Look at our Capitol building. Look at the... Uh, uh, of course, if, if, if we really point out all of this, look at the large obelisk, the, uh, the Washington Monument. Look at how the streets of Washington are set up. But anywhere you go in this country, you will see that we use water that it, uh, follows down like through an aqueduct. I mean, we still use the same principles to get water to our houses. It is gravity feed. So we're still in the Greco-Roman Empire. That is to say, the time of Greco-Roman, not necessarily the empire because Rome has fallen. But we're talking about the time that is now. We still have a senate. We still have congressmen, we still have representatives, as they did in Rome. We have laws, as they did in Rome, and we certainly have coliseums where sports are played, and uh, we certainly have the same kind of filth that was going on in Rome, and a lot of false god worship. But then we get to number seven, which is what? The Antichrist. He's the one that's not yet come, and will continue a short season. Now, now that we have understood that, let's read the next verse. And the beast that was, in other words, was in the first age, and is not, that is to say, is not right now, is not yet, even he is the eighth, that is to say, Satan, the Antichrist, is the eighth. Now, he's the seventh in the office of Antichrist. But he is the eighth, and he is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So that ought to tell you who it is. This is talking about the son of perdition as mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, you can cross-reference this with Revelation 12 again, the beast. But the eighth is Satan himself. In other words, Satan as Satan after his tribulation, after the deception, when he is loosed for a short season. Revelation chapter 20 verse 3. Satan shall be loosed for a short season before he is cast into perdition. So verse 11, when it says the beast that was, okay, who was the, who, the king beast of the uh, rebellion against God? That was Satan. He is not, in other words, he's not present on the earth yet. Even he is the eighth. In other words, he's Satan. And is of the seven. Every one of these kingdoms had something against God. Every one of them persecuted God at some point in history. And then it says, and goeth into perdition. So we named the kingdoms there, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. In other words, it, it, it's not time for that yet. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And what hour are we talking about here? What hour do these ten take power with the beast system and with the beast, which is the eighth. We're talking about the hour of temptation here, the tribulation. 
verse 13. These have one mind. In other words, they're all in agreement. They're with one accord. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. In other words, they're on Satan's side. They're Satan's locust army. They're going to give their strength, their power, and their deceptive powers to Satan. Verse 14. And these shall make war with the Lamb. You know who the Lamb of God is. That's why it's capitalized here. They're going to make war with Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and they that are with Him, that is to say on His side, are called, chosen, and faithful. Verse 15. And he saith unto me, that is to say the angel who's explaining this, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. In other words, what is this world made up of? Peoples. Different peoples, different races, multitudes, masses of them, nations, everyone has nations and kingdoms, and tongues. In other words, they speak different languages. It's the entire world. Verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, which we know are the ten kings, these shall hate the whore. In other words, they're not for the whore and never were. They hate the whore. And shall make her desolate. In other words, they're going to destroy her and naked. In other words, going to take away her righteous acts and eat her flesh. They're going to devour her and burn her with fire. Not the holy fire, my friend. They're going to cause her to be burned of fire if something drastic doesn't happen in the millennium. But you need to understand that these ten horns, these ten kings and Satan... Because the beast and the ten horns are mentioned in this verse. Hate the whore. They hate the people of the world. They hate the multitudes, the nations, the tongues, and the peoples. And they shall make the people desolate. They're going to destroy them with deception. They're going to make them naked. They're going to strip them away so that they are bare naked. Remember when Adam and Eve were naked in the garden? We're not talking about nudity here. We're talking about spiritual nakedness. And they're going to eat her flesh. They're going to devour her. What is it that the locust army does? They come along with their little stings and inject their poison. And what does the locust do? They devour their prey. And burn her with fire. Verse 17. For God hath put it into their hearts to fulfill His will. And to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. In other words, God has hardened their hearts. And to agree, in other words, to agree together and to give their kingdom unto the beast. In other words, they're going to be kings upon this earth, but they're serving Satan, Antichrist. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. In other words, Babylon. But where will Babylon be centered? Where will be the chief place of Babylon upon this earth? Jerusalem. Which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt. Where our Lord was also crucified. That's where this power happens. It's where the two witnesses will be killed. Revelation chapter 11. Now we're going to go back and we're going to go to the Old Testament. And we're going to find out a little more about this harlotry and what it is that anger is so God about, uh, 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 bad about it. What makes God so angry about it? Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16 and we're going to begin re reading at verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, verse 2, Son of man, that is to say, man in the flesh, caused Jerusalem to know her abominations, her filth. In other words, what is the abomination of Jerusalem today? Well, they're Zionists. They do not accept Christ as the Lord and Savior. 
They're building their own temple to God. Only they don't even know which God they serve. And what else is significant about Jerusalem? That's where Satan shall appear. Where he's going to come to claiming to be Christ returned. Verse 3. And say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord God to his city. The, the habitation of peace. Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. In other words, it's in Palestine, in the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother was a Hittite. In other words, this, these would be the patriarchs of the Jeb Jebusites. Verse 4. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut. In other words, your, your umbilical cord was not even severed. Neither wast thou washed with water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. In other words, you, you had a rough birth and you were born in a place of filth where they practiced filth. Verse 5. None I pitied thee to do any of these things unto thee. In other words, to take care of you, to swaddle you as a newborn child should be. To have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person. They, they hated this woman. In the day thou was born. In other words, why did they hate this woman? They were idolatrous. Jerusalem had an unclean birth. Verse 6. And when I passed by thee, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood. And I said unto thee, while thou was in thy own blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy own blood, live. In other words, God did not give up on what would become his bride. Now, symbolically, we're talking about Jerusalem and its unclean birth, but God caused it to grow. In other words, it wasn't always run by the Jebusites. It became the city of David and then the habitation of peace, where God put his mark and his name. Verse 7. And I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great. In other words, you've become a famous, notable city. And thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned. In other words, as, the, as a woman that's grown to womanhood. And thy hair is grown, whereas thou wast bare, uh, excuse me, naked and bare. In other words, naked and bare, why? For the same reason it's going to be naked and bare again. False idols, idolatry, uncleanness. Verse 8. Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee, and behold, thy time was the time of love. In other words, you were maturing into a, a young lady. And I spread my skirt over thee. That is to say, God took this one in marriage. And covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee. In other words, married, and gave them a covenant, the Old Testament. Saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. God's favorite place upon the earth. Verse 9. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. In other words, you could look at this washing here uh, to wash away the filth, even as the baptism. And I anointed thee with oil. I sent you the anointed one. Verse 10. And I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen. And I covered thee with silk. In other words, God's bride he so loved. Verse 11. I decked thee also with ornaments. And put bracelets upon thy hands. And a chain on thy neck. Now this is not a big heavy chain. This is, this is a, like a chain that women wear today for, for jewelry, costume jewelry or what have you. Verse 12. And I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thy ears, and a beautiful crown upon thy head. I made you my queen. 
Verse 13. Thus was thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work, and thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou was exceedingly beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. In other words, the kingdom of Israel. And then the kingdom of Judah. Verse 14. And thy renown, that is to say, your, your reputation and, and remembrance, remembrance, went forth among the heathen for thy beauty. And it was perfect through my comeliness, that is to say, the, the splendor which I had put on thee, saith the Lord God. Verse 15. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty. Uh-oh. What was it that caused Satan to fall again? Isaiah 14. But thou trusted in thine own beauty and playedest the harlot because of thy renown, because of your fame. And poured out thy fornications to every one that passed by. His it was. In other words, what does this mean? You could look at this one of two ways to understand this. This is God's wife. Okay? Uh, spiritually speaking, in metaphor, this is God's wife. But she laid down and opened her legs for everyone that passed by. In other words, every doctrine except that of God, they worshipped. Every other God, they worshipped. Verse 16. And of thy garments thou didst take, and dexed out thy high places in diverse colors. In other words, mix the colors. You know, where do we see diverse colors nowadays that are not really so holy? Well, let's see. They took God's rainbow, which is a symbol of promise, and turned it into a symbol of pride, which is to say perversion. And then they added to that pride and perversion even more colors for transgenderism. Now, is this happening in Jerusalem? Naturally not. But the same thing applies. In other words, they worship something other than God. And platest the harlot thereupon. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. In other words, there is no truth in their doctrines. There's no truth in their gods because they're not gods. They're made of men's hands. And of them comes no revelation. In other words, nothing they say is going to be so. Verse 17. Thou hast also taken my, thy fair jewels of my gold and my silver. You know, God's gold and silver is tried by the fire. It's pure. Thou hast taken my, thy jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given thee, and madest uh, to thyself images of men, and didst com commit whoredom with them. You know, this conjures up visions which probably should not be spoken, but uh, the same thing applies. However, I'm only going to use the euphemistic metaphor. They took the riches that God gave them, and the blessings that God gave them, and the wealth that God gave them, and they turn that gold and that silver into their own gods. Verse 18. And thy took us thy, thy and took us thy bordered garments and covered us them. And thou hast set mine oil and mine incense before them. In other words, you are offering to them. You're anointing them instead of me. If you ever doubt that God is Christ, this should give you clarity here. Christ is the husbandman. Verse 19. My meat also which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, wherewith I fed thee, thou hast set it before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, saith the Lord God. You know, the flour and the oil and the honey here, are symbolic in three places of God's word. It was sweet as the tongue as honey. It is of the anointing oil. 
and the flour which makes up the bread of life, wherewith God fed his children. They took that and set it before others for a sweet savor. In other words, they worshipped other gods in place of God. Do you understand now what harlotry means? Verse 20. Moreover, thou hast taken my, thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, generations of Israelites and Judas, Judaites. And these thou hast sacrificed to them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? In other words, is this a small thing to you that you've done this? Verse 21. Thou hast slain my children, the souls that God created, and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. For them who? The, the false gods. This is the practice of Molech, which was done to Baal. They burned their own children and sacrificed to false gods. When God did not command that to be done, men commanded that with their own false doctrines. Verse 22. And in all thine abominations, and all your filth, and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, when thou wast naked, and bare, and wast polluted in thy blood. In other words, you haven't remembered where God found you. Verse 23. And it came to pass, after all thy wickedness, Woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God. In other words, double warning unto thee. Verse 24. Thou hast built unto thee an eminent place, and hast made thee a high place in every street. A high place is a place of worship. In other words, God only had one place of worship, the temple. That was his house. But they made an altar in every high street, or in every high place of the street. High place is simply a uh, place meaning up above the rest, where they walked up steps to go present their uh, their um, gifts to the false gods, or their offerings to the false gods. Verse 25. Thou hast built thy high place in every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred, and hast opened thy feet to everyone that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms, and Feet here is the same as legs. In other words, you have spread your legs for everyone that has come by. Naturally, we're not talking about the sexual act except in metaphor here. It means you have fallen for every God that came unto you. You've fallen for every doctrine that came unto you and has not obeyed the word of the Lord. And you've multiplied your whoredoms. Verse 26. Thou hast also committed fornications with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. In other words, they went back to the ways of Egypt. Remember what it was that was going on in Egypt? Bondage, slavery, and false god worship to the Egyptian gods. Verse 27. Behold, that is to say, look, therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee, and have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee. Now, do you remember what we read just no time ago in Revelation chapter 17 about how they hate the whore? I took away thine ordinary food. In other words, I took away what I had given you to eat, and delivered you unto the will of them that hate thee. The daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. In other words, even the Gentiles are ashamed of you. Verse 28. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast insatiable, or better said in our time, insatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldest not be satisfied. And you can look at this in the very sexual nature of insatiable and not satisfied, but it, you need to look at it metaphorically. In other words, couldn't get enough of their false doctrines. Couldn't get enough of their uh, false gods. Verse 29. You, you remember uh, what happened to Samaria up there when the uh, Assyrians took them over, don't you? 
And, and why the Assyrians weren't allowed to take them over? Because the Israelites, the ten northern tribes, made their own place of worship and set two golden calves out there. And God allowed them to be taken over and dispersed. Verse 29. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea. You know where Chaldea is? That's Babylon. And yet thou wast not satisfied therewith. In other words, they have not only sinned with Pharaoh, they've sinned with Assyria, they've also sinned with Babylon. And you've got all the captivities right there, except for Rome. But then again, we're in the Old Testament this time. In other words, you've taken the gods of all of these people and worshipped them. You've taken their doctrines. You build altars unto their gods and sacrificed your children unto them. Verse 30. How weak is thine heart? In other words, heart here should be translated mind. How weak is your mind, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious whorish woman, in other words, you know what an imperious horse woman is? That's a prostitute. You're doing the work of a prostitute. Verse 31. In that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as an harlot, in that thou scornest higher. In other words, you wouldn't even take pay for your prostitution. In other words, what, what, what does this mean by this? She's paying her lovers. She's paying them. They're not paying her for her uh, for her hire. You know what you hire a prostitute for? I don't have to tell you. In other words, she beckoned to these to come to her so she could partake of their false doctrines. Verse 32. But as a wife that committeth adultery which taketh strangers instead of her husband. Christ is our husband. Verse 33. They give gift to all whores, but thou givest thy gift to all thy lovers. In other words, usually the custom is that a prostitute, whorish woman, will take money for her wares. But you're paying them. In other words, it's like paying a bunch of gigolos. Only the gigolos are Egypt, Assyria, Chaldea, and the filth of the land of Canaan. And hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. <laughs> you know, I could use some really bad analogies here, but I'm not going to. Just think about a woman having men on every side of her for whoredom. Verse 34. And the contrary is in thee from the other women in thy whoredoms. In other words, what does that mean? Real whores wouldn't do this. Whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given to thee, therefore thou art contrary. In other words, a, a, a normal harlot would get paid for her services. You're paying people instead. Verse 35. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 36. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out, and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers, and with all the idols of thy abominations, and with the blood of thy children which thou did give unto them, in other words, you sacrificed unto these false gods, Verse 37, Behold, therefore I will gather thy lovers, in whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all the, him, them uh, whom thou hast loved, and all them that thou hast hated, and I will gather them round about thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. In other words, the Gentiles around you are going to behold your fall. They're going to see your nakedness. Verse 38. And I will judge thee as a woman that breaketh wedlock. And shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. 
Do you know what the penalty was for breaking wedlock? That is to say, non-legally, just being a, har a harlot and sleeping with another man? It was death. And do you know what the penalty for those that shed blood is that are judged? Death. And do you know who Satan is? Death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. One that has the power of death. Verse 39. And I will also give thee into their hand. And they shall throw down thine eminent place, and break down thy high places, and they shall strip thee of thy clothes, and take thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. In other words, they're going to desolate you. And all of these armies mentioned are types, that is to say, Pharaoh's army, the Assyrian army, the Babylonian army, are types of Satan's locust army. So that's what we're really talking about prophetically here. They're going to come in and they're going to have their way with you and they're going to leave you naked and they're going to take all of your sweet little delicacies and all of your greatness, all of your wealth. Verse 40. They shall also bring up a company against thee and they shall stone thee with stones and thrust thee through with their swords. Now, we know who the false rock is, right? So we got the stones here. And we know what the word is. That's the word of God. That is the two-edged sword of the tongue of Christ, Revelation 1.16. But they're going to thrust her through with false swords. With their swords. In other words, we're not talking about literal stoning here and literal running through of a human being with swords. We're talking about they're going to give you the false rocks. Worn smoothly over a long period of time. And they're going to run you through with their swords. False doctrine. False word. Verse 41. And they shall burn thine houses with fire. And execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women. Now, what did it say that Satan's locust army was going to do to the harlot? Burn her with fire? Burn thine houses? These would be houses of worship. And all this is going to happen in the sight of many women. And I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou shalt no more give hire anymore. In other words, you're not going to be paying another god for anything anymore. Verse 42. So I will make my fury towards thee to rest and my jealousy to depart from thee and I will be quiet and will be no more angry. That is to say when he's accomplished this upon her. In other words, God's wrath comes upon this place and then he ceases from anger. Now again, what is going to happen on the day that Christ returns? He's returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he's going to put down Satan and Satan's locust army and there will be rest and there will be peace. Verse 43 Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth and hast fretted me in all these things behold therefore I will also recompense thy way upon thine head saith the Lord God and thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. In other words, you're not going to continue in this path. Verse 44. Behold, everyone that useth proverbs, that is to say, sayings or even uh, songs of wisdom, shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. In other words, what was her mother again? A Hittite. And do you remember in the book of Revelation where the daughter of Babylon is, is called into question for her things? That she does her abominations? In other words, this one was born of an unclean birth. Jebusites of the Hittites and the Amorites. And this people has taken abomination to a new level. And in the future sense, the queen of Babylon, of the end times, mystery Babylon, which pro prophetically we're talking about here anyway, her daughter is going to be just like her. 
In other words, they're going to do the same things that were done in the Old Testament that God is angry about here. Verse 45. Thou art thy mother's daughter that loatheth her husband and her children. You know, is that not prophetical to today? Women wanting abortions today and, and, and saying it is a woman's right to murder their children. Why? They hate their children. They don't want their children. And women today saying they don't need men anymore. Turning into lesbians. And men turning into homosexuals. Same difference. Still souls going against God's nature. And thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite and your father an Amorite. In other words, Gentile people. They are your sisters and brothers, including the Kenite. The Kenites are Gentiles. They are not of Israel. For 46. And thine elder sister is Samaria. That is to say, Watch Mountain. That's where the ten tribes were. And she and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at the right hand, is Sodom and her sisters. Remember what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah? In other words, where was Sodom located at? Well, that was in Palestine. That was of the land of Canaan. Up there right on the Dead Sea. And Samaria, as you know, is where the ten tribes were, where they placed their two golden crabs, as we alluded to earlier, and started worshiping different gods. They didn't want to go down to Jerusalem to God's house anymore. Too much of a trip. And they went into captivity. Verse 47. Yet thou hast not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations. But... As if it were a very little thing, thou wast corrupted more than they all in thy ways. In other words, Jerusalem was corrupted more than the ten tribes to the north and the Canaanite peoples that God moved out of the land before them. Verse 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, nor she nor her daughters as thou hast done. Thou and thy daughters. In other words, Sodom was not as bad as you. Do you remember what Christ told the scribes and Pharisees? He said, the children of Sodom get into heaven before you. The publicans and the sinners and the harlots get into heaven before you. Why was God so mad at the scribes and Pharisees, the keepers of the law? Because they did not practice the law. Neither to this day that they practice the law. They do not accept Christ and they think that works get them into heaven. They think that following the Torah and the Tanakh and, and listening to the Talmud is what earns them good works and gets them into heaven. But what of their sins? To whom do they atone now that they don't make offerings unto God anymore? <clears throat> In other words, they don't kill bullocks and sheep, he goats and the like. God didn't want those things anyway. Verse 49. That is to say, up until recently, they started sacrificing again. As they build this new temple. Verse 49. Behold, this was the, iniqui the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. Oh, let me wave my pride flag. Fullness of bread. In other words, they had plenty to eat. It was a city, a functioning city. They had plenty to eat. An abundance of idleness. In other words, laziness was in her. And in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Didn't care about them. Didn't care about the poor and needy. Why? They were too busy with their perversion. Too busy with their idleness. Too busy being full of bread, but not the bread of life. In other words, what did they do too? They worshipped false gods. But they had full stomachs. Verse 50. And they were naughty, or excuse me, haughty. In other words, they looked up to themselves, were haughty, they were prideful, and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. He rained down hailstones on them. He rained down fire on them. The buildings 
that were there still testify to this day because they are ashen places that are only vaguely recognizable as buildings. But not even a nuclear warhead would burn that hot without blowing it to smithereens and yet those buildings still stand turned to ashes in only the way that God himself can do. Which is an example of what? Hell. Verse 51. Neither has Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thy abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. In other words, you made your sisters to look good. You have justified them. You made them to look good with all the harlotry that you've done. What, what harlotry did they do in Jerusalem? Not only did they build high places in every street, they killed the Son of God when He came to them. They killed God in the flesh when He came to them. When He did the things written of Him, they hated Him for it. And why did they hate Him for it? Because it broke the letter of their law, which they understood not. Verse 52. Thou also, which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins, which thou hast committed, more abominable than they. In other words, Judah sat in judgment of her sisters. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame, in that thou hast justified thy sisters. In other words, you did far worse than them. You made them to look good. You made them look like little choir uh, people at the altar. Verse 53. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them. In other words, you know what captivity we're talking about here? Are you, don't look at Sodom as the people, or Samaria, because no one lives in Sodom currently. Sodom is an empty place. Now in Samaria, yes, people live there, but it's not the Israelites. So what are we talking about here? What captivity? When Satan appears as the Antichrist, he's going to take captives. Verse 54 that thou mayest bear thine own shame and mayest be confounded, that is confused, in all that thou hast done and in all in, in that that thou art a comfort unto them. A comfort unto who? The sinners. Verse 55. When thy sisters, Sodom and her daughters, shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate. Now, we're talking about a return here. Again, no one lives there now, that is to say, in Sodom. But one day it will be inhabited again. Then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. Why? Because that's the day of the Lord. Verse 56. For thy sister Sodom was not mentioned in thy mouth in the day of thy pride. In other words, they forgot completely about Sodom or they kept quiet about it. Because everyone knows what happened at Sodom and why and people don't even talk about it this day. Matter of fact, a lot of people just whisk that right out of the Bible and all the books that speak against that lifestyle. Verse 57. Before thy wickedness was discovered, as at the time of thy reproach of the daughters of Syria... And all that are round about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about. Verse 58. Thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abominations, saith the Lord. In other words, you did that. Before your wickedness was discovered by the daughters of Assyria and by the Philistines, you were already headed into this. This is a classic case of what happens when someone has it too good. Look at the United States of America now, the land of the free. How free it used to be, how good it was, and now what's happening to it. Inflation, taxes, unreasonable laws, unfairness, people 
storming across the border. The laws not being upheld. The Constitution not being upheld. And people arguing for perversion. People arguing for the death of children. People arguing to remove God from us. 59. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which hast despised the oath in breaking the covenant. What covenant? The covenant that God made with them. Not only the first one, but now the second one too. The new covenant, the New Testament. Verse 60. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant which I made with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. And that, of course, is the, the new covenant, the new, the new Testament, the gospel. I'm going to give Christ to them. Verse 61. Then thou shalt remember thy ways, and be ashamed. When thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder and thy younger, in other words, uh, Samaria and Sodom, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. In other words, not by your agreement, not by the things you've done, verse 62. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. You know, Christ is the Lord. It is not only Yah, Yahovah, some say Yahweh, Christ is part of the Godhead. Christ said, I and my Father are one for a reason. Christ told Thomas, you asked to see the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Christ is called Emmanuel, God with us. God dwelling with man. Verse 63. That thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. In other words, when God is satisfied, you're never going to open your mouth again. You're going to be confounded. But none of this will be spoken of again after God is pacified and after God has brought the correction. We're going to go to one more book. Jeremiah chapter 3. The reason for reading this is to let you understand what it is about harlotry that the biblical language uses the term harlot, the harlot, harlotry, and all of these things for it is not just adultery in the act of men and women. That too is a sin. But this is leaving your husband, your God, for another. This is why God is so enraged. And especially for them which are no gods, including Satan and his supernatural Nephilim uh, locust army. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's uh, wife, that is to say, he shall return shall he return unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? In other words, no. Uh, once a woman is put away, she's never supposed to go back to the same man. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet Return again to me, saith the Lord. In other words, God is willing to take you back even though you've played the harlot with many lovers. Imagine what love God has to do something like that. This might be better said in Ari, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return unto me again. What, what if it read like this? Yet thou hast not returned unto me. In other words, the one that lifted you up out of your blood and out of your filth and gave you gold and made you a good husband and doted on you and gave you jewels and bracelets and jewelry and clothed you in silk and fine linen and embroidered garments. The one who gave you everything you turn your back on. For another. Or for many. 
verse 2. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lain with. In the ways thou hast sat far for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. You know what the Arabian in the wilderness, have you ever looked up the word Arabi? It means to braid. It means to mix. It means to meddle oneself with. And what happens to the Arabians people? Do they worship the same God as we? No, they don't. At one time, they did worship the same God. But now they don't. And they do not accept Christ as their Savior. They only see Him as a prophet. Verse 3. Therefore the showers have been withholden. And there has been no latter rain. And thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. You know why forehead plays into this so much in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well, first of all, that's in the New Testament, that's where the name Mystery Babylon is written. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But why the forehead? Because what is in your forehead? Your mind. Is the mark on the forehead? No, it's in the forehead. But not only that, the forehead of the mystery Babylon and these is become hard as flint. In other words, they will not hear God. Verse 4. Wilt thou from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide for my youth? In other words, <laughs> they claim to still worship the same God they always have. In other words, the, the people even in Judea right now, the Zionists, claim that God is their father. Remember what the Kenites, the scribes and Pharisees said to Christ in John chapter 8? We have one father, even God. And Christ told them, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I came forth from the father. But did they love him? No, they killed him. They used a, a world government to kill him. They used Rome to kill him and their power. Verse 5. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. Verse 6. The Lord has also said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up on every high mountain and every under green, every, excuse me, under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Now remember, Samaria, Israel, had not done as bad as her sister Judah, but she still played the harlot. Verse 7. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. In other words, God pleaded for her to turn back. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Verse eight. And I saw, when for the call for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, and I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. In other words. God witnessed it that when the children of Judah saw what Israel did in putting away God and they were taken into captivity and God divorced them and allowed them to be dispersed among the Gentiles, that Judah did not fear because of that. Judah did not learn a lesson, but went and played the harlot also. Did the exact same. Verse 9. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Now, what are idols made out of and covered over with metal? Stones and stocks. Stocks of wood. Verse 10. 
And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not returned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly, in other words, feignedly returned, claim to still worship God. They claim to still worship God, but are harlots of a false doctrine, which does not even accept Christ as king. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. In other words, what happened to Judah? Does anybody know what happened to Judah? Well, they were taken into the captivity and they returned. And then when Christ came to them, they put him to death. And God's anger, just 30, let's see, 69 AD, uh, about 36 years later, they went into captivity. In other words, what kind of captivity? Well, Rome was already occupying them, but Rome dispersed them out of the land. So they went among the Gentiles. They didn't have their place anymore. So they went captive to the Gentiles and dispersed into Europe, specifically towards what is now known as Germany. And some of them went towards uh, Russia, and others went towards Spain. And that's why we have three main sects of the Jews, the Khazaria, the uh, um, Iberian sect. You know, it, it, it figures that I can't remember them. I always speak of these three sects of the Jews. But um, the Ashkenazi and the uh, the Khazar, the Ashkenazi, and the well, dagnabbit, it, my memory ain't just going to allow me to remember it. But anyway, there are three sects of the Jews. Broken up. And they dispersed across Europe and across uh, the, the Slavic states and the steppes of Russia and into Russia. And that's where many of them have returned back from, but they're not all true Jews. There is a good fig, naturally, and there is a bad fig. And the bad fig are the ones that are in power now. The bad fig, of course, being the Kenite, and you could say mongrel Jews, which are not truly of the, the seed line of, of Judah. Verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. In other words, God is able to forgive. Why do you think he sent us a Messiah? Verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. In other words, acknowledge, acknowledge that you have sinned, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. In other words, you have to acknowledge this. Verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and will bring you to Zion. You know where Zion is? That's upon the earth. You ever read the book of Revelation where Christ and his uh, elect are seen on Mount Zion? you find that also written in Revelation chapter uh, 20, I believe it is. Verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. In other words, pastors that are after my own heart. And I shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I'm going to give you understanding of the scripture. Verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord. They shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to, come it to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. Why? The Ark of the Covenant was God's old covenant. In other words, they're not going to need the Ark of the Covenant anymore. 
It is only a type of the mercy seat of the Lord. We're going to be before the real mercy seat. Not the one made with men's hands. Verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Not the throne of Satan. Not the throne of other gods. The throne of the Lord. And all nations shall be gathered unto it. Now do you know what we're talking about here? We're talking about the millennium. The day of the Lord. They're going to be gathered back to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, the habitation of peace. Neither shall they walk any more after the indignation of their evil heart. Excuse me, the imagination of their evil heart. Because that's what a false god is. is it comes out of the imagination of men. Just like atheism. People say, well, atheism is a doctrine of no faith. No, it isn't. Atheism is a faith in nothing as God. But it is a faith. It has a creed. It has a belief system. It just doesn't have a deity. It doesn't have a God. Verse 18. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. Now, where are the Jews at? Where is Judah? They're going to come out of the north with Israel. In other words, are we talking about the remnant that still remains amongst Israel? Somewhat. But we're also going to talk about those that are Jews that have become secular, or Jews that hold to their heritage but not to their faith. Or people who have even forgotten their Jews, as the Israelites forgot who they are. Verse 19. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children, and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shall not turn away from me. Do you understand what he's just said there? How am I going to bring you, my children, into a good and pleasant land, the one sworn to your fathers, and a goodly heritage to be the host of nations? Or the host of nations. Either way you want to look at it. And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and thou shalt not turn away from me. Verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Verse 21. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Long history of doing this, quite frankly. Verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. In other words, that's what Israel's going to say. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Verse 23. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills or from the multitude of mountains. Now, where is the harlot set upon? Seems like there were seven mountains mentioned. Truly, in the Lord God is our the salvation of Israel. Let's, let's read that verse again. Truly in vain, that is to say, is emptiness. In emptiness is salvation hoped for from the hills, the high places of worship, and from the multitude of mountains, that is to say the nations, or even the entire earth, where God is not worshipped. Truly in the Lord God is the salvation of Israel. Why? What does Yahshua mean? Salvation. God's salvation. Yah's salvation. The salvation of Israel. The prince that has power with God. The prince that... returns to God. Verse 24. 
For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from their youth, their flocks and their herds and their sons and their daughters. Verse 25. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers. From our youth even unto this day, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Now, what is the only way you can recompense that? To obey the voice of the Lord God. To do the works of God. To hear the oracles of God. To worship He that came in the flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. So, there you have it. I hope now you understand why God is so angry with harlotry and why harlotry is used to convey what is going to happen in the last time, the end days, in Jerusalem, in the Middle East, in Palestine, when Satan comes here claiming to be Christ's return and the world falls and worships him. That being said, let me wish you a happy Passover coming up in just a few days hence. Probably won't see you again before the Passover, but uh, we'll be taking communion and we'll be celebrating the Passover. And I hope you all have a joyous Passover in the Lord. And remembrance of our Lord and Savior and what He has accomplished for us in defeating death and paving a way to salvation. But let me remind you to stay in your Father's Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a great day. If you can't stay in it every day for this reason or that reason, Certainly stay in it every week. Stay familiar with your Father's Word. And use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, the E.W. Bulger Companion Bible, the Maserati Tapes, the Septuagint, whatever you can get your hands on to study our Father's Word. And brothers and sisters, before you study our Father's Word, always pray to God for guidance and wisdom as you study His Word. And Brothers and sisters, especially here at this holy time of year, pray for those that are walking in darkness because God knows they are the ones that need it the most. So, until we see you again, happy Passover, and uh, may God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.